We have two questions that I know uh, here from the audience, and I'd like, uh, as you ask a question, just introduce yourself to us, and if you direct it to a person on the panel uh, or to the panel as a whole, please go ahead, sir. Maybe to the whole panel. Uh, my introduction, I'm Vimal Mahendra. I'm based in New Delhi, but I work out of Geneva for the IEC election. Thank you. Vimal Mahendru, IEC ambassador. I work for the International Electrotechnical Commission in Geneva, although I'm based in New Delhi, so, and I met Mr. Tripathi a few times there in New Delhi. My question is generally to all of you. Uh, I mean, I hear you talking about finance and innovation and uh, uh, funding, a uh, 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 lot of things, but nobody's talking about standards. Actually, Electricity has to be safe, as safe as it is here for all of us here in UK. So why is it that we are not talking about safety, which comes through standards, and also taking technologies and the innovations we are talking about global? That's Thank you. Why don't we pass? We'll take a few questions. So everybody start thinking about standards. Sir. Hi there, my name is Chris Castro. I'm here representing the city of Orlando uh, as our director of sustainability and resilience. Um, this is a great conversation. One thing that we're starting to think about in this transition is how to deal with long duration storage. We've been talking about generation, but if we're truly gonna make this pivot in this transition, we need to make sure it's reliable, it's affordable, it's resilient, of course, right? Um, so we're starting to tinker with uh, green hydrogen uh, as long-term duration storage. And I'm interested in your perspective about that technology and whether you see green hydrogen as we move forward as also a combustible technology for uh, base load generation as well. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? This is probably the only round that we, we have time for. So if you do have one, please put your hand up. Yes, sir, please. Do introduce yourself before you ask. Um, thank you. My name is Leo Chi. I'm here with the Sonoma County in California, and I'm on the delegation with Global Council for Science and the Environment. Um, I had a question for Joyce. I'm just curious about um, your perspective around um, building those wind facilities offshore in developed countries like the United States. I mean, I'm already hearing concern from constituents who are worried about um, possible projects that are hundreds of miles away. So I'm just thinking about the amount of automatic opposition that automatically happens um, when people hear about offshore projects. I mean, for everyone on the panel, I would be curious just how you're able to convince the public that sometimes the energy production needs to be a priority over other concerns. Thank you so much. What we'll do to close, so we, we're going to invite Jake from NRDC to give us a summary, but before we do, I'm going to give each one of you 30 seconds, and I'm going to direct the questions we've heard at each one of you as we go along, and I'm going to start with Joyce, because you just heard the speaker ask a question to you. So perhaps, Joyce, you could give us the answer to that question and close. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, we are hugely excited about the offshore wind targets that have been set in the U.S. That's across both fixed offshore winds for now, it's building, it's coming off the East Coast, as well as floating offshore wind, which is really going to take off off the West Coast. Um, I, I was a bit surprised to hear that the opposition is coming from uh, the projects which are hundreds of miles away from communities because it's actually uh, more common, and, and this is the factor when we talk about nimbyism in the renewable sector, that there's opposition from communities communities and having the large-scale projects on their doorstep or within sight. Um, after 30 kilometers from a, uh, when you're standing on the coastline, it's actually really difficult to even see the offshore wind farms in operation. But I would just go back to what's come out very strongly from every intervention here today, which is that renewable energy needs to be framed in a citizen-centric way, where we're translating these benefits into how many homes can they power with clean energy, how many jobs they, they can create, and offshore wind is particularly unique in this respect because it means creating jobs along coastlines, along uh, coastal communities that are often facing um, you know, economic uh, difficulties, and, and it can really help to revitalize these kinds of areas, um, upgrading ports, make, bringing in advanced technology, um, and it's really sustainable jobs as well. Offshore wind farms operate for around 25 years on average, so when you have a job in operations and in maintenance, that's a job for life. 
Thank you. Uh, Benigno, I'm going to pick a piece of that question, which is green hydrogen, because I know that it's, it's a subject that uh, is talked about a lot of this conference and also you're focusing on. Is there anything about green hydrogen that should accelerate that p pipeline of renewables in Latin America, in your opinion? Well, the, <clears throat> what it is, it is uh, uh, demand, a lot of demand for going into uh, green hydrogen. Uh, and we are working with the, with, with the countries for one side and with the private sector for the other side in, in, in trying to set up the, 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 the perfect place to go. It's a, it's a, it's a, I, I think that there are many, some countries are more advanced than others in order to, to go to, to, to move to the green hydrogen. But I think that what we believe is a place to go, but we have to, to do a lot more studies yet to that, but we believe that it can be a game changer in the future. Thank you. Upendra, your colleague um, talked about safety and standards. Is that a question you could answer? Yeah, in fact, uh, 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 yes, uh, I, I remember my meeting and uh, it's very critical that uh, uh, standards uh, and uh, protocols are extremely important for the whole electricity sector. And given uh, the example of India uh, that, you know, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency and uh, uh, the CEE, Central Electrical uh, Authorities, and the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, you know, the, they, they, they continuously improve it. And the international uh, platforms have been very useful because in most cases, uh, they adopt the standards uh, from international level and various products. But uh, uh, so far as the solar realm is concerned, you know, a lot more has to be done. Uh, uh, and uh, given the flexibility in the global market, you know, panels moving, like, for example, India imports 80, uh, uh, around 90 percent of... I'm afraid of... Pandemic. ...and Taiwan. Uh, and uh, so it's not... Uh, the standards are getting globalized. You know, standards uh, are becoming... Uh, it's more, more critical than ever that we both maintain uh, standards, not only for the, in the you know, products, uh, uh, but for also services, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's correctly pointed out that uh, in more, most countries it's taking a legal form, uh, but a lot more has to be done. And uh, this is where I think the international uh, organizations uh, like the UN um, bodies and all that, uh, even the civil society sector has to play a very important role. It is not merely formulation of standards, but it's also making them aware, uh, uh, making citizens aware of the uh, standards and uh, uh, you know their applications to goods and services are very critical. Thank you, Pendra. Thank you, Pendra. And just finally, Bright, uh, one of the questions, Chris, I think, mentioned uh, the aspects of resilience. He also mentioned the aspects of ju just transition, and you talked about adaptation. But I, I want to know, we, we refer to this pipeline as no regrets, and I think it adds more than just power, uh, as you were saying. So would you like to perhaps answer to that and close? Yeah, uh, I believe it's imperative that, uh, for instance, when you're designing projects, uh, it's imperative that you actually work with the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning. Uh, so what we've done is that uh, whenever we're designing projects, we actually take into uh, consideration O and M, uh, so operation and maintenance over the years. Uh, but uh, attached to that, we also look at uh, livelihood. Uh, so. Uh, talking about adaptation, uh, you've extended the grid, uh, but what are some of the livelihood activities uh, that could actually benefit uh, from having access to the grid extended to, to a community? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's always embedded uh, within the projects we implement. Uh, we actually have a Jeff project we're implementing currently, and it looks, like, it looks at last mile connectivity and uh, using renewable energy uh, as a source of livelihood. Uh, so people moving away from agriculture to things like carpentry, uh, building markets for them, and uh, basically uh, trying to uh, get most of your population from rain-fed uh, agriculture, uh, getting into mechanization, uh, solar irrigation. Uh, but one other aspect I need to mention here around uh, safety as well as standards. Uh, one challenge around actually the solar uh, so, uh, solar energy is the end life of batteries. Mm. Uh, coming from an LDC, uh, that's something we need to uh, start thinking about and uh, transitioning into that week. Uh, thank uh, as, you, I think. as do we all. So I appreciate all of the panelists. Thank you, Pendra. Thank you, Bright. Thank you, Benigno. Thank you, Joyce. And Jake, uh, if